morning everyone i am continuing with the series of lectures which the met division abvim is uh, is taking uh, today we are starting with the first lecture of the webinar on biostatistics and to take this lecture we have dr neelam roy he is the director professor and head of department department of community medicine in abvim and uh, along with us is also there dr anchal kakkar who is a professor department of anesthesiology so ma'am i am enabling the screen share i have already enabled the screen sharing so uh, you can start your lecture thank you dr nitin let me share my screen so i'll be talking about sample size uh, estimation for this i'll just briefly go through the basic concepts which will be required for sample size uh, calculation in terms of bio statistics so before we go on with sample size estimation we should know what do we mean by statistics and bio statistics as we are aware uh, most of us are uh, of the opinion that statistics starts when we have data with us after conducting a research study but it is not true bio statistics uh, is a part of the study since its inception starting from data collection till the final interpretation of the results so how will it help in data collection uh, we calculate sample size so that our study has uh, adequate power and uh, we can interpret our results uh, meaningfully and also we uh, try to validate our study tools by using statistical method so this statistics uh, role of statistics starts from the uh, beginning of the study starting from data collection then compilation of data then uh, tabulation then analysis to provide the results or interpretation of your data so when we apply these statistical methods uh in the field of biology public health or medicine it is called as biostatistics so before going on to data, uh, sample size calculation we should know what is data what are various types of various vari variables and which variable is to choose for uh, calculating the sample size so data uh, when we say data it means it is a factual information which is recorded and used for the purpose of analysis so it is the raw information which uh, <clears throat> from which uh, statistics are created or we analyze this raw information to provide the meaningful results so the sources of data can be primary or secondary primary data is the data which we collect ourselves and the secondary data is the data which is collected by somebody else for some other purpose but we are using that data for the purpose of our research study like we may use the data from the hospital records to uh, answer a specific research question this is called as the secondary data so there are many studies which use secondary data also so uh, now you must have heard the word variable so what do we mean by variable as the name suggests it varies from person to person or from time to time in the same person so it is defined as an attribute quality or characteristic or proper property of a person or things which are under study and which can be quantitatively measured or enumerated and the values which are taken by these variable is called as the data like height weight age these are the variables while the values taken by these variables is called as data like height of 145 or 154 cm so height is a variable while 154 cm is the data which is derived from this variable so we have two main types of uh, variables independent and dependent variable so we must be aware which variable is dependent and which variables are independent whenever we proceed towards analysis so what do we mean by independent variable it is the variable that is manipulated applied or applied by the investigator or which explains the outcome like birth weight of a child may be explained by the 
or may be affected by the maternal age or age at marriage of the woman or spacing between two successive pregnancies so all these are independent factors which are affecting the outcome that is the birth weight of the child while the dependent variables are also called as the outcome variables so these are the variables which are affected by the independent variable so like the birth weight i have given you the example birth weight is the outcome variable which is affected by the independent variables like maternal age or birth spacing or perinatal mortality can be the outcome variable and other factors like PIH may affect the perinatal mortality, so PIH becomes the independent variable. So once you have collected data, you must categorize your, or you must have a list of independent variables and dependent variables with you, so that you can proceed further with the analysis. Then another important first step in any statistical method is identifying the type of data because all statistical methods they are um, dependent on the type of data so they vary with the type of data so the two basic types of data are qualitative and quantitative data so qualitative data can be nominal or ordinal so nominal data uh, is the data which uh, or the variable which has mutually exclusive categories and is unordered mutually exclusive for example in blood group the person with blood group a cannot have a blood group of b so these are mutually exclusive categories similarly we can have ordinal data they are also mutually exclusive but they are ordered whenever there is some inherent order in the data we call it as an uh, as an ordinal uh, variable or ordinal data <coughs> For example, disease severity, it can be mild, moderate, severe. So there is an order in the data, like staging of cancer. So you have stage one, stage two, stage three. So there is an order. So it becomes ordinal data. Then in quantitative data, we can have discrete and continuous uh, data. Discrete data in this, the variable often represents counts, integer values, the whole numbers like number of children can be 1 2 3 it cannot be 1.5 or 2.5 so it becomes your discrete data while continuous quantitative data will be in the variable that can take any value within a range of uh, values like height in centimeters height can be 154.5 centimeter it can be 154.2 centimeters so it can take any value within a range so it becomes a continuous data. So you need to identify point, uh, whether your data is quantitative or qualitative, then only you proceed further for sample size calculation and also for further analysis of your data. So this is very critical as I have told you earlier, to identify the data before calculating sample size and analysis. Let me give you some examples. Like in this, types of hepatitis, like hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, this is a type of nominal uh, data where you have mutually exclusive categories and you have uh, whole uh, different types of categories without any order. It is unordered. Body temperature can be a quantitative continuous data, like gender can be a nominal data, blood, blood type. I have already given this example as nominal data. Serum sodium levels is a quantitative continuous data where it can take any values. And as similarly, SGOT level is a uh, continuous uh, quantitative data. Age is a continuous quantitative data. The socioeconomic status, there is some inherent order in this, like uh, lower uh, socioeconomic status, middle class, higher class. So there is an order, so it becomes ordinal qualitative data. So this is the first step to identify your type of data whenever you are calculating sample size. So why do we need to do sampling? As we all are aware, we cannot do or study all population. We cannot contact everyone in a uh, specified population. So we have to take a sample out of the population and we make uh, certain measurements on this sample and then we generalize the results of this sample on the entire population 
So if you see this example, you have a bus with many passengers. Now you have to take, take a sample of population from this uh, vehicle and then you may you calculate some sample values and then you make statistical inferences regarding the entire population. So the values in the population, the inferred values in the population like mean standard deviation or proportion, these values, these are called as parameters. While the values which we calculate for samples, we call it as statistic. So this is the difference. Whenever in uh, statistics you read the word parameter, it means we are talking of the population values. When we say statistic, we mean it is the sample value. So from the population, you do uh, you take out a sample by following certain sub sampling procedures and then you make some uh, calculations and uh, do analysis on this sample and by inferential statistics you generalize this these uh, sample statistics on the population to calculate the population parameter so this is very important to have the representative sample out of this population so how will we get this representative sample? Like in this, if you uh, have to take, uh, see it is, if it is a 20 seater bus and you have to take a sample of five and you have taken all uh, the five persons you have taken from this bus, they were of the age less than five years. So it will wrongly interpret that the population in this bus, all the passengers in this bus are of age less than five years. So it is not representing the actual situation or the actual age group of this, uh, of the passengers of this person. So we need to have a representative sample. Then only you can have meaningful inferences about the population. So sampling is a very important first step in every research study. So sampling procedure in, involves two important technique, the estimation, and number two is the sampling technique. So your sampling technique has to be uh, accurate or so that you get the representative sample, and your sample size should also be adequate so that you can have uh, meaningful results which can be generalized to the entire population. So sampling pro uh, process includes first the defining your population from which you have to take the sample. Then you should have a sampling frame which will have a list of all the individuals in that particular uh, sampling frame. Then we determine the sample size and then we choose a specific sampling technique or sample method and then we, we select the sample based on the calculated sample size. So there are various sampling techniques. We will not uh, talk here today about the various sampling techniques. We will talk more on sample size estimation. Just to give you a brief idea, there are two major uh, types of sampling. One is the non-probability sampling and the other is probability sampling. Probability sampling is the sampling where each and every individual in the sampling frame have the known probability of selection of the sample. So this is the most robust method of sampling. So there are various types of probability sampling like simple random sampling, it can be systematic random sampling, it can be stratified random sampling wherein you want to include various strata of the population, it can be cluster sampling when the population is uh, sparsely distributed. While non-probability sampling is not as robust as probability sampling, but it is useful in uh, some specific situations where you do not have a uh, defined sampling frame. In that case, this uh, type of sampling is of help. Now coming to sample size determination. Why do we need to have a sample size uh, uh, calculation? Since uh, we are talking of meaningful 
results or meaningful interpretation of our data, we need to have sample that will give you the real situation in the entire population. So uh, if you select sample which is too small, it will fail to detect the true differences. If the sample is small, you can't uh, detect the difference in the uh, two groups or you cannot estimate the correct prevalence of a particular uh, health issue. So your sample has to be adequate. If you are taking a very large sample size, then it will be wastage of time and money because you could do similar, uh, meaning you can have similar uh, meaningful result with a smaller sample size. So you are wasting time and money on studying more of population. And also, if the sample size is very large, it will report the minute relations or differences as significant. So we need to have adequate sample size, which is neither too small nor too large, and it will give you a meaningful results. So it has to be calculated beforehand at the planning stage of your uh, study design. So, so what all is needed when you calculate sample size? See, I have uh, experienced many of the uh, uh, researchers, they meet me in the lift, they ask me, this is our research question, how much should be the sample size? It's not easy and it, there is no quick answer to this sample size calculation. We need to have some background information. Based on this background information, we calculate sample size and also it will depend on the type of data which I have already emphasized earlier. So we need to know various uh, important parameters. First is the estimated prevalence or standard deviation. So I will be discussing in detail what does it mean. Like in case of qualitative data, the data is usually presented as proportions. So in that case, <clears throat> we need uh, the proportion to calculate sample size. While in uh, quantitative variables, which is expressed in mean and standard deviation, in that case, we need standard deviation for calculating sample size. In addition, we have to define the cost of our study, uh, which is which we intend to have so that we can calculate sample size accordingly. Because we have different set of uh, sample size calculation formulae for different uh, levels of confidence interval and different levels of power. So like for uh, it is universally accepted that uh, <clears throat> we can take confidence interval of 95% and power of 80%. That is most of the uh, formulae for sample size are based on this only 95% confidence interval and 80% power. But in case if you want confidence, higher confidence interval of say 99%, then I'll be giving you some example how to change your formula. Then allowable error or precision of the study. That also has to be predefined before calculation of uh, sample study. So I'll be explaining with some examples. As I said, sample size will depend on various uh, parameters. One of uh, them is uh, uh, the type of data. The other is type of study, whether it is a single group study or a two group study or multiple group study, whether it is a paired study, whether it is a um, <clears throat> validity of a, a test. So sample size will depend on the type of study also and the number of groups in the study. So uh, for single group studies, then the outcome variable. So as I said, you should have a list of uh, dependent and independent variables. Dependent variable is the outcome variable. So for sample size uh, calculation, we consider the outcome variable. So if the outcome variable is qualitative, the simplest formula used for sample size is 4PQ by L square. Most of you must have seen this formula. So here P is the estimated prevalence or the proportion of the outcome variable, which is under study. And Q is the 100 minus P or 1 minus P and L is the allowable error.
and it is important to note that all these parameters p q and h could be in the same unit so what do we mean by this precision or reliable error if uh, <coughs> we want to estimate the true prevalence of a disease in population so it is not a single value it will vary from uh, there will be a range so this range which can be estimated by this sample size is called as the allowable error so, so it will be plus minus l that if you have taken the allowable error as 5% it will mean that uh, the prevalence from plus minus this 5% of the prevalence can be estimated from this uh, sample size like uh, taking the example of uh, a survey in which there was an estimation of prevalence of influenza virus infection in school kids suppose the available evidence suggests that approximately 20% of the children they have antibodies to the virus and assuming the investigator wants to estimate the prevalence within 6% of the true value so 6% becomes your allowable error or the precision and as per this formula 20% is the estimated prevalence of influenza virus infection while q is the 100 minus prevalence which comes out to be 80% and your precision is 6% so your sample size will be 4 into 20 into 80 divided by 6 square which comes out to be 177.8 and hence you can round it off to 180 and hence uh, you require a sample size of 180 children for estimating the prevalence in that particular group so this is how you calculate sample size for single group studies where the outcome variable is qualitative in nature then in other studies where the outcome measure is a quantitative variable and it is a single group study we have to take into consideration the standard deviation of that parameter so all these values of prevalence and standard deviation will be derived from the previous literature or from um, or from a pilot study which you have conducted or from the experience of the investigator so these values will be derived from the previous liter available literature so here the formula becomes 4 into square of standard deviation divided by the square of the allowable error <clears throat> suppose an investigator this is an example suppose an investigator has some evidence suggesting that the standard deviation of rat weight for some experiment is about 455 grams and he wishes to provide an estimate within 80 grams of the true average so the uh, required sample size will be 4 into 455 square divided by the 80 square thus we need about 430 rats in each of the groups or uh, this is a single group study so you need a 130 rats to estimate the uh, weight of the rats in that particular experiment so in two group studies also we have two separate formula for quantitative and qualitative variables like uh, for uh, when the outcome variables are are qualitative this is the formula which is used here pc means percentage from the control group while pe is the percentage from the experimental group so you have two groups you are comparing two groups so you will have a proportion from the control group and the experimental group and q is the 100 minus p that we have already seen in, as we have already seen in the single group study and d is the difference between the two groups that is the control and the experimental group and c is a constant so what is a c i have simplified simplified this formula c is a calculation for uh, considering um, 
confidence interval of 95% and power of 50%, we derive a value which is called as C. So what is the value of this C? If we are considering a confidence interval of 95%, the value will be 7.85. While if we are taking confidence interval as 99%, the value of C will be 11.68. As you can see, the value of C has increased when we are taking the confidence interval of 95% or 99% because as the confidence interval increases, we need to have a larger sample size. So this is how we uh, derive this value of C. So this is the example, like if you have pre prevalence in the control group as 25%, while in the experimental group it is 65%, then the difference becomes uh, 0.4, and then we choose the um, uh, confidence interval as 95%, then applying this formula, the sample size comes out to be 28. So what does this 28 mean? It does not mean 28 in both the groups. It means 28 in each group. In each group means control and experimental group. In case of quantitative outcome variable, as I said earlier, we take standard deviation into consideration while calculating sample size. So this is the formula which we use for uh, calculating sample size to compare means. So here S is the standard deviation, D is the difference between the two groups, and the C is the constant, which we have already seen in the previous uh, example. So if we want to compare the efficacy of two drugs in, S in the treatment of asthma, <clears throat> the outcome variable here is the forced expiratory volume in one second and one hour uh, after treatment. A previous study has reported that mean at the UN in persons with treated asthma was too liver with a standard deviation of one liter. The investigator would like to be able to detect a difference of 10% or more in mean FEV1 between the two treatment groups. So this is the example wherein you have to calculate sample size. Here the standard deviation is given and the difference between the two groups is also given and then we apply these values to the formula and then we calculate the sample size. In this case, we consider the confidence interval as 95%, the value of C becomes 7.85 and here standard deviation is 1 and the difference is 0.2, the sample size comes out to be 394 in each group. So this is important. At times, uh, some I'm up start paired, so we have a separate formula for paired studies pair studies are robust more robust studies as compared to the unpaired studies and hence we require a smaller sample size so here the sample, the formula is uh, this paired study means it is a pre-test or post-test uh, measurements or before and after uh, some measurements before and after treatment. So here we have a separate formula which gives a little smaller sample size because these are more robust study. The same, uh, probably uh, the biases are less in uh, paired studies as compared to unpaired studies. Like in this example, the sample size comes out to be only nine. So you will always have smaller sample size for uh, paired studies. Then we have uh, other special situations also like for uh, in some studies, there is only correlation available. In some studies, you are doing validity of a test. Here you use sensitivity and specificity for calculating sample size. So here you replace P with sensitivity and specificity. 
So there are many other formula of, or methods for calculating sample size depending on the situation. Like in some cases you have area under the curve, so you have a separate uh, method of calculating sample size. Then for RCTs, randomized control trials, you have separate formula for superiority trials, equivalence trials, or non-inferiority trials. Then at times you have studies with the more than two arms. So it will have separate formula. Then repeated measure studies, they also have separate uh, separate uh, methods. Uh, what I have given is the basic uh, formula which we usually need while we conduct a research study. So there are certain softwares also available for sample size calculation, like you can calculate from AppInfo, OpenInfo, or GBAR. So there are many softwares which are also available. Thank you, Dr. Nitin. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. It was a wonderful talk. I think you made a very complex topic very simple. So if, uh, if time permits, can I ask a simple thing, ma'am? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Achal, you can oh. go ahead. Uh, so, so ma'am, I just wanted to ask that uh, what about sampling in some um, uh, pilot studies and e-surveys? What about them? Uh, I say pilot surveys usually don't require uh, sample size calculation because usually you do pilot survey for those uh, uh, situations where you do not have any background information. So if you do not have any background information, you cannot have sample size calculation, but you can have uh, like uh, in case of, uh, in case you do not have uh, prior information on prevalence of a particular disease, you can take 50% as the prevalence and calculate sample size, which gives you the maximum sample size and which will uh, include all the variables. So this is how you proceed with the samples. Uh, Ma'am, there are one or two questions. Uh, firstly, that uh, suppose if we calculate a minimum sample size by a particular method, which you just mentioned in the studies, and the number of patients, which, uh, you know, we get, suppose it's 200, but actually the number of patients which we are getting in the OPD or in the ward are less. So what can be done in this situation? <laughs> So for uh, the purpose of thesis, my advice is always to have uh, the study topic for which you will get a sample size in your own hospital. Because the sample size calculation gives, makes your study robust. If you have lesser sample size, the power of your study decreases. So you need to have optimum sample size. In case you are doing a funded research, then you can have a multi-centric study where you can achieve the sample size. So we should calculate the minimum sample size, try to achieve the minimum sample size so that your study is robust and it can be published in good journals and it will give you meaningful results which can be uh, interpreted and generalized to the population. And ma'am, is it always essential to calculate a sample size? It is advisable to calculate sample size whenever you are doing. While in qualitative research, uh, sample size may not be calculated. You usually keep on ca uh, recruiting the participants till there is a saturation or till the time you get similar responses. So in qualitative research, it may not be required, but for most of the quantitative research, it is advisable to calculate sample size based on at least 95% confidence interval and 80% power. And uh, one last thing. So that you can, um, uh, so that one you last can generalize thing. your results on the population. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, one last thing that, uh, uh, you know, many of the times uh, we face a problem, especially being members of the institutional review board, that uh, people come and say that, sir, we have study ka purana koi reference hi mila. There is no pre-existing prevalence. There is no pre-existing study. This is something de novo we are trying. And usually they are thesis students, so we don't, you know, they don't actually have a time to do a pilot study. So at in that point of time, should we really stress upon them to do a small pilot study or should we just ask them that, uh, 
they can go ahead with the minimum sample, whatever sample size they will get or they are likely to get. It, it is always good to have a pilot study when you don't have uh, previous literature available. But uh, it may not be feasible most of the times due to time constraints. So in that case, you can take the P value or the prevalence value as 50%, which gives you the maximum, the maximum sample. sample. So it will take care of all the variables in your study. Mm -hmm. So this is how we proceed. But sample size has to be calculated to have a robust study. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, it was a wonderful lecture. Uh, so with this, uh, I thank Dr. Neelam Roy and Dr. Achal. And uh, I will close the meeting now. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Achal. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And continuing with the series of lectures uh, which are being conducted by the Medical Education Technology Division, Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Medical Sciences and Dr. Ramanur Loya Hospital, in the uh, Basics of Research and Ethics webinar, today uh, we are having a lecture on data collection and data cleaning, a very important topic. And to take this lecture, we have a very wonderful person, Dr. Sanjeet Panesar. He is an associate professor, Department of Community Medicine in Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Medical Sciences. So Dr. Sanjeet, uh, he is also a member of the Institutional Review Board. I now request Dr. Sanjeet to uh, kindly start the lecture. Dr. Sanjeet, I have already enabled the screen sharing. So you can share the screen and then you can start the lecture. Thank you, sir. Uh... Today's lecture, as sir already introduced, is on data collection and data cleaning. Uh, let's straight away go to the lecture. It's an important topic for all of us because we have to come across in research in one way or the other, either as a faculty or as a mentor or as a student. So we usually consider that data collection will be just done on Excel or some software or we'll just collect the data regarding these all things when we design the protocol or the questionnaire. It is a crucial thing, data collection, because whatever has been collected, it affects the results, the analysis, and whatever interpretation you're gonna make out of the data you have or the protocol you have submitted. So data collection is usually done keeping in consideration what are the objectives of the study. And accordingly, it is simultaneously started once the clearance is there. So I'll be covering the topic under these broad headings, sources of data. Then there are subtypes, new routine, patient notes, secondary data, data collection forms, types, instruction, anonymity and confidentiality, piloting, form filling and coding, data quality, and lastly, data cleaning. See, this lecture is not like a workshop wherein we show how data entry is to be done in a particular software. This is primarily to give you a sensitization about the guidance or the guidelines, what, what all has to be kept in mind while we are thinking of data collection or the means of data collection. Now, the sources of data, the four sources, new, routine, patient notes, and secondary data, each has a different advantage or a disadvantage. Coming on to new data, this is done when a study is specifically designed. Okay, usually while we are writing the protocol or we are trying to write a research project for the institute, the type of tool, what we develop is all considering the new data because it has not been collected in the past. So there are few inherent advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that we have a control over what is to be collected. And whatever we uh, record in the data, that is the current information, latest information. The disadvantage is it has cost implication and the time to collect, process, and then analyze. And in case if there is some participant refusal or a subject is lost in the follow-up, so we have missing data. The problem of missing data may arise time and again, and we'll see across in various type of data sources, we have this consistent problem of missing data. 
then is a routine data routine data is that the data is being collected for some other purpose there is some investigation which is going on in the hospital there is a particular service which is being catered or which is being delivered in the hospital and it is not necessarily directly related to research however our research partly takes into account the topic of interest and part of the data is already done routinely so we collect the data from that laboratory or that uh, the room of x-ray or ultrasound or particular department and then we try to use that data for analysis it has few advantages that it is quick to obtain already it is computerized because it's a routine investigation there is a proper format in which it is being collected but whether that format is useful to us or fully useful or partly useful that we are unaware of so it may be already processed or computerized usually it has a much lower cost than the cost implicated in a primary research data collection the disadvantage is that it is a routine data we have no control over whether the data collected can be increased or decreased as per our need the data is collected in a specific format and that format is fixed so the data availability it is not under our control then missing data in case if there is some data which in routine investigation was missed we will see it like that only we do not have a chance to fill that data it is difficult and we discussed the format already because it's a routine data it may not be exactly the way we want to accept it next is patient notes these are the handwritten file records of the patient usually we ask for file of a particular disease from the medical record section or from a particular ward wherein the patients are currently being treated and we try to interpret the file record as per our study the advantage is it is relatively quick because there is already a record at hand and the cost implication is less the disadvantage is again because it is a data which was already recorded so we don't have a control over it the missing records are missed we may not be able to fill the missing gaps and moreover the most important the third point of disadvantage is that these are handwritten notes so it may be difficult to read if the writing is not legible or clear it may be difficult for us to search the parameter what we are looking for and there may be a there may be a format which may be missing or which may be different from our requirement coming on to secondary data now secondary data are the data collected or recorded for some other research study and which are used by us for example there is a census data available for example there is a sample registration scheme or a civil registration data available there is a death data available at the hospital and we want to do some analysis on that data available the advantage is it is relatively quick it is already processed so data checking or data cleaning is less required and usually the cost is lesser so the highest cost is with the primary data collection new data the disadvantage again it is similar to the previous two that we don't have a control over the data which is available the missing data again may be difficult to fill and the data may not be in the format in which it is required lastly it may be out of date for example if we take the data of census 2011 right now it is the year 2021 it's a decade old data so it may not actually represent the scenario what we are studying right now coming on to the next part which is data collection now data collection as a clinician you are busy in your schedules as a para clinician you are busy in your labs as a non clinician you are busy in your theories data collection is as important as deciding on to a protocol or deciding on to a result or interpretation of a result of a study each part is crucial while data collection becomes important because this is going to give you the nidus on which you are going to run all the analysis so the way you collect that information this becomes important it forms the basis of the analytical software which you are going to use how you are going to collect the data so that it can be used with the software there are few pick requisites for the data collection form the research question and research design are already settled 
and it has been decided what data is to be collected. It is only then that a research tool is made and you start off with the collection. Now the use is, it is either a written or an electronic record. Some during the PG time, mostly or in the field, mostly in the previous times we were using hard copies, papers or sheets or a photocopy of the set of the study tool. Over the time, this has improvised to tabs wherein you have a drop down menu and you keep on ticking. So as per the convenience, as per the availability of resources, we may have paper or electronic form. And ultimately, this is used so as to collect the data in the format which will be analyzed using a computer or a computer based software. When we talk about types, paper or electronic, in the paper form, there are few different guidelines set which is to be followed specific for it. For the electronic data capture, there is a specific set of guidelines. In the table, we can see that there are few guidelines for the paper form, few for the electronic data capture. There are few guidelines which are common for both. We'll be also looking at that. First of all, let's see for the paper, the performer which has to be made, the study tool which has been designed, it should be clear and easy to fill out. There should be adequate space for writing the numbers or the text. Sometimes a particular section may be colored differently so as to highlight that section or to make it more attractive. In the follow-up study, sometimes a different colored set of question, uh, questionnaire is used so as it becomes easy to ascertain that it's a follow-up patient to track as well as to fill the record. It has to be kept in mind while designing the study tool that if it is a too long tool, the person may not you know, feel comfortable answering all. So what we do, we try to make it as short as possible, but it has to be kept in mind that all essential details pertinent to our study are there. So the question paper may be the, the questionnaire tool needs a proof study again and again, so that it should be very crisp, very concise to the point and covering the entire topic of interest on which the research is being done. Coming on to the electronic data capture, in this, whenever you make an entry on the tab, it becomes a new file. So you keep on editing the file and keep on adding the new files. Do not delete the previous files. There are various tools. Epidata is another tool. One tool is a Kogo toolbox. So you have different platforms wherein the online or a computer-based tab is used for data collection. So each time you enter some information, it is updated from the previous version which you were having. So you have to save it. Keep in mind, you do not delete the previous version. Each of the page in the electronic record can be missed in case if it doesn't has a UID tag. So you have to make sure that each of the form has a unique identification particular to that subject so that at the end, they could be merged together. In case if there is some audit trail, audit trail is done usually so as to improvise a clinical process in the hospital. Okay. So it has to be with the date and the file number. And again, we have to keep the record. We have to back up all the files. So keep in mind the master copy of the data in which the addition or the editing of the data is taking place. At times we may use filters to jump to the questions of a particular interest or to omit the questions which are not applicable. In computer language, it is called as algorithm, which gives rise to a structured questionnaire. In case if the response is no, so all the questions which were for some aspect which had been answered yes, those questions will get omitted. So the time wastage is held. It is handled there. And there has to be a programmed encoding. In case of hard copy, we usually have the responses written in the code forms one, two, three, and each of the following code has a label in front of it. For example, educational qualification, illiterate code one, or up to primary code two, middle is code three, then higher secondary is code four, and so on. In tabs, we have a programming in which while designing that tool 
already the auto generated code is there so whatever answer is being ticked or the box is being touched upon automatically the codes gets generated and it goes into the backup software file wherein the data is being recorded now there are few instructions which are common to both the methods few of them we have covered partly few of them are common the id number for each subject should be there for tracking purpose there should be a record of the date on which date the form was filled it is important in more important in randomized control trials or the follow up studies there should be clear instructions which should be given to the person who is going to fill the questionnaire in the field so that there is no ambiguity in filling the responses to the questions which are asked in the questionnaire tool in larger studies training of the field staff is to be done it is important so that the information which you are having is correct then design is such design should be that it should minimize the errors which are there so most of the questions instead of leaving them open ended which may be omitted by the person who is filling in the questionnaire we have all the anticipated responses to that particular question and we make boxes so whatever response is given the person may accordingly take when the, we have to ensure that whatever response is being given it is clearly recorded for example if we the example is if height is to be measured it has to be measured in what units the unit should be mentioned whether it is to be measured in meters or whether it should be measured in centimeters so accordingly whatever question is there in case if there is some set of data which needs a recording in the form of a particular unit the si system or a metric system or the imperial system or sps system whatever is being used it has to be mentioned the units should be mentioned all the items which we are going to collect in the study tool they should be numbered the pages should be numbered preferably use boxes or lines appropriate to the anticipated response what you are going to get to that particular question moreover while designing the tool it all the steps which are taken they should be in the appropriate format and we have to think about what way we are going to analyze this data so that at the starting itself the data is recorded in the manner that it will be useful while the time of analysis for example if mean value is to be calculated then let's record the absolute age of the person mean value of age is to be if we have to analyze the mean value of the age then instead of putting the age bracket categories like 10 to 20 years or 20 to 30 years let's put the appropriate age what's the age in completed years as the absolute value so that we are able to calculate the mean out of it then all the process we should be having an organized filing system so that in case if some record needs to be checked we can go to a particular date and if it is organized it will be easy for us to find the correct coming on to the next part when we are using a study tool for data collection anonymity and confidentiality needs to be maintained at the time of protocol itself usually it is a prerequisite in the consent that the information regarding the identity of the person will stay confidential because it's primarily for the research purpose there may be some diseases which are being taken into consideration for research which may have associated social stigma with them so it becomes more so important in them so instead of name as an identifier use a uid number unique id number or a hospital registration number and the backup file for it in the form of unique id number or the codes and the name of the person that should be stored separately and securely even if the study is to be done anonymously still a tracking id has to be there because in case if there is some query then we may be able to follow up with the original form and correct it then is piloting we often talk about that whatever study tool is being used it has to be piloted so what is piloting what is its use piloting is done to test the data collection process how in variable circumstances it's going to practically get easy for or difficult for the person who is collecting the data so usually we take smaller sample approximately 10% of the actual study sample is taken it may or may not be the disease of interest it may or may not be the same place where you are going to conduct the original study it can be done anywhere so 
you take that smaller sample and you try to subject them to the questions which are in their study tool so as to get all the possible responses and whatever responses you get you simply check or you write the text it helps us to ensure that what are the problems we face while introducing the study tool and in case if there is a problem we may be able to resolve it prior to the main data collection moreover it also helps us it also helps us to identify how much time is being taken for that performer if it needs to be lengthened or shortened or whether the topic is fully covered or not are these questions sufficient enough to cover the topic of interest about which the research is being done or some modification is needed so that's the role of piloting it helps us to ensure the form then accommodate all the responses which are possible or simply check if there is enough free space for the text answer so if we keep in mind all these points we understand that the importance of piloting is crucial coming to the form filling whosoever person is using the tool to be filled whether it is the beneficiary whether it is the patient or the case of interest or whether it is some other person who is going to subject the case of interest to a schedule to a questionnaire schedule so there should be always instructions to about how to fill the response and the detail of the instruction or the complexity of instruction will depend on the level of experience the person is filling the form for example if a medical person a doctor is filling the form we may give detailed instruction in case if it is a paraclinical then it has to be in the language so that the paraclinical can understand it has to be very crisp small instruction if it is a layman we have to tell the instruction in his own local language and not we try not to complicate it too much try to keep it as simple as possible ki in sawalon ka jawab aap ha ya na mein de sakte hain ya aapke dard ka aap 1 se 10 ke numbers ke andar bata sakte hain ki kitna aapka pain hai then in case if we have doing an extensive study if the multiple people are going to be the part of the study or multiple people are going to use the interview schedule to ask the questions then we need to train them so that everybody is at the same page in case if we are using handwritten notes then they have to know that what part of the information is the one which we need to record so there are some items which need to be considered while using the study tool that the writing has to be very clear preferably use a pen instead of a pencil if there is a mistake don't overwrite on it it causes confusion you omit it and rewrite it correctly or you can use a correction fluid if the space is not there if it's a hard copy then you can write if it's a tab you can backspace erase it and then write there has to be examples so as to show them how the form is to be filled sometimes people guess the data just by looking at the person that this might be his weight or in case if the record was already taken then they forgot to fill the gender then according to the name supposedly name kamal came the the beneficiary whose interview was taken his name was kamal so the person guesses that kamal could be a female name so he writes female whereas kamal could be a male name so there may be a doubt so guessing should be discouraged no guessing has to be done and calculations try to keep the study tool information receptive receiving calculation leave the calculations for the analysis part so the person should just receive the information and he should just mention the information if the person keeps on calculating there that will lead to error the topic of coding uh, it is important for us to understand what coding is in the form of research study tools the relevance of coding is that it helps us to enter the non numerical as well as numerical data to be used in statistical analysis with a computer now coding will assign a specific unique number to each of the possible response which we are get going to get in each of the study questionnaire tool or the questionnaire schedule the need is that a particular category is assigned a particular number 
it is important that while we are doing the analysis, the, comp the computer analyzes everything using the codes. However, the results which are available in the form of codes at the end of analysis, we need to add appropriate label for each of the code. For example, code 1, 2, 3 is for BMI measurement, wherein 1 stands for underweight, 2 is for normal weight and 3 is for overweight or obese. So accordingly, as per the study tool question or the responses which are there in the question, there has to be appropriate code and at the same time appropriate label. When should we start designing the code? The coding has to be started at the same time when we are designing the study tool. The time when we are designing the questionnaire at the same time we should be generating the codes also. How we can do that? That in a hard copy we write it on the right side of the study tool or we can use a separate sheet of paper to avoid cluttering. In case of online computer-based tablets, there is a programmed in response wherein each of the response is having a separate code. It goes in the programming in. How we choose the code? In case if there is a dichotomous response of yes and no, our intuition says yes is one and no is zero. That kind of response may hold very well when we have yes or no as a response. However, in the studies, many times the responses are not always in yes or no. For example, in case if we are talking about pain, the intensity of pain is graded as no pain, mild pain, moderate and severe pain. So there are more than two categories of response. So the coding is to be done like zero for no pain, one for mild pain, two for moderate and three for severe pain. Whatever coding you do, it should be mentioned as a key for a backup. Usually intuitive coding is done for yes or no response. It has minimum of error. Because if we do not do intuitive coding, if intuition say coding jo ko lag rahi hai, zero and one key, no or yes, ke liye, agar hum usko different rakhe. for example, yes, ke liye main one ho, no, ke liye two. Kar कोई बंदा है वो यस के लिए टू करता है नो के लिए वन करता है इट विल कॉज कंफ्यूजन सो इंटुइटिव कोडिंग इज यूजुअली बेटर इन केस इफ देयर आर मोर देन टू कैटेगरीज और द रिस्पोंसेस आर नॉट ऑलवेज यस और नो देन कोडिंग हैज टू बी डन एंड वी हैव टू मेंटेन द की ऑफ द कोडिंग एज अ बैकअप ऑलवेज इट कैन बी मेंटेन एज अ सेपरेट शीट ऑन एक्सेल इट कैन बी मेंटेन्ड एज अ सेपरेट पेपर अलोंग विद द स्टडी टूल और in case if the space is there, then on the right hand side of the study tool itself, if it's a hard copy. Coming on to the topic of missing data. We have seen the sources of data collection, what all advantages and disadvantages are there. Even if we are doing a new data, as for our study, there are chances that we may be having missing data. So instead of leaving that response as blank, it's better to assign a code. For example, if the question is not applicable, then you mention it as multiple times nine, four times or five times nine, such that we give it a value which cannot be a real response. Okay. For example, if an answer is to be given to a question as yes or no, if the person has not answered it and nine is mentioned, that means the person hasn't answered this question. If we leave it blank, it means that it could be either the person hasn't answered or the interviewer failed to ask this question to the interviewee. For example, if a height is recorded in centimeters, so if the value is not available, we can write it as triple nine centimeter. See, 1000 triple nine centimeter, it may not be the possible height because the average height of human being we know it is around. 1.7 meters to say around 2.5 meters. So triple nine is a response which cannot be there in reality. So we know that this question was not uh, answered by the interviewee. Interviewer asked the person to give the height. However, the details were not mentioned. In case of computer package, the computer denotes the missing value usually as a dot. 
so there is different way uh, missing values mentioned it is better to keep a code for a missing value because we have to understand when the response is not applicable when the response was not given and we have to differentiate it from when the interviewer was not able to ask the response ask the question taking another example sometimes the response to a question may be not applicable such that when you ask a person if he smokes or not the answer is no so all the questions which are pertinent to smoking they become not applicable in that person because at the onset itself he has answered the first question as no so to have those responses differently we can either put it as 888888 or a different response or sometimes we have a structured hard copy questionnaire wherein along with the response a semicolon is put and it is mentioned if no jump to question number x y z whatever is the following question jumping over a few questions so that the time is saved it is basically a structured performer in the computer algorithm or in the tab there are algorithm based schematics which are made initially for the study tool and once they are finalized according to the response response given by the interviewee automatically it will direct you to the questions which have to be answered and automatically the other algorithms other arm questions they become as not applicable so a coding is already put in if the performer is structured it will save time in case if the questions were omitted then data imputation is needed for example the interviewer were not able to ask these questions maybe some constraint some other reason the hard copy the page was missing whatever be the reason how do we respond to that for that we have data imputation methods data imputation can be done manually or sometimes if it's a smaller values if it's a big data then data imputation may be difficult for that we need softwares or sometimes all together those values are removed from the study this has implication on to the study because this appropriate sample size what we have taken if it reduces from the minimum sample size what we have mentioned at the preset then the study's well the study's power or the study's confidence level to capture the reality it is lost coming on to data quality so that we don't miss everything so that we do we don't miss any information which is pertinent or important data quality maintenance is very important it is a critical thing the monitoring is very important and it is more so important at the time of study start the reason being because the interviewer is not trained enough or he is not in a practice enough so as to ask all the questions in that routine moreover the chances of committing an error are more because it's a new set of questions which is being asked so we keep multiple checks okay so the checks will help us to correct the problem when it has occurred if we do not do this if we do not do quality maintenance these all errors will turn up by at the time of analysis uh, then that then it will be difficult if the proper quality check is not done some responses may be missed totally in case if the person has the 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 patient has moved out of station or the patient has died then the response will be missed totally okay. so quality check are very important now how we check for quality first is we check for completion of forms so there are few points that all the pages of the form should be filled out if not what was the reason why they were left are all the questions completed if not again does the gap which is there truly reflect the unknown data or some has been accidentally missed and the writing of the person is it clear or not then we come to the accuracy filled hai complete hai sare pages hain sara data hai koi omit nahi hua then we come to accuracy double check ki kya jo is jo reading li hai is it is it correct or not so most of the readings which take into account physical readings say weight of the person height of the person or blood pressure of the person usually they are taken multiple times twice or thrice so it gives a double check to the sample or if there is any critical data for example the clinical picture of the person was somehow different and the lab parameter was different so next time when the person is contacted we again ask for the same report or the same test report 
if the person has brought in the follow up in the follow up we can ask for the previous report also and we see whether the data was correct or not then actions are taken as necessary either instructions are given to the interviewer the retraining of people are done so that all of them are on the same page or we change the form if a particular question is not being answered properly you change the language or the preset of the questions which is being asked and we check the changes again have the changes been implemented and we document whatever checks have been made whatever inaccuracies were there whatever quality control flaws were there and when the flaws were rectified and quality was achieved coming on to the last part which is data cleaning now once the information has been taken up in the tab electronic media or it has been taken up as a hard copy all the data collected has to be entered in the computer so the process of checking the data which has been collected and entered into the computer that process is called as data cleaning and it takes into account that the data which has been entered onto the computer it is correct because error can occur at any time it can be because of miss report or miss information or it could be miss record some record which may be missing or while entering there may have been a typological error so data cleaning is important some errors can be identified by simple checks for example we know what the maximum and minimum values of a particular response could be there so if we put then the filter it will show the outlier result it will show the outlier the information which has been entered it will be get highlighted for example if we write about the education which has been completed by the subject we know it is from class 1st to 12th either a person will be illiterate or it will be from class 1st to 12th in case if the person has written 18 so it is clearly standing out of the range so we mention it as that this is wrong so we cross check again if we have maintained the filing if we have maintained the tracking id we will be able to find out what the actual information was and if the person's name and phone number is there along with the uid we see the uid in case if it is missing in the form we can be we may be able to contact that person so to complete that information sometimes the errors which are in the same range they may get omitted during this filter for them when we make cross tabulations and we see if there are any inconsistent combinations for example the study says that smoking habits in the subject are recorded but when we have taken the study subjects as smoker and non smoker the person is non smoker but all the responses of cigarette smoking have been answered by that person so it is likely that while asking that question there has been some error while recording the response there has been an error so we may be able to identify by either putting a filter or by cross tabulation sometimes the information has to be confirmed double back okay you have to contact the person again in person just so to complete the information so the session is open for questions okay thank you dr sanjeev it was a wonderful lecture yes sir and uh, i think a very pertinent topic has been discussed in great detail so dr sanjeev i have a few questions for you ji sir okay. so so you talked about training so how important is training to the manpower uh, which are involved in filling up the form uh, sir in case if uh, we are having a large study being conducted or some project which is at a national sub national level or maybe some crucial information for which simultaneously we have put in lot of teams so it is important that every person who is Uh, acting as an interview interviewer in the field they should be having knowledge at the same level they should be aware of that 
what response of the question is there primarily it is to maintain the accuracy of the information and the consistency of the information that in case if the same question is asked to the same person by some other person some second interviewer also asks the same question to the same interviewee the response is same it is to maintain the consistency of the questionnaire and to have an accuracy of information so that all manpower which is being trained as an interviewer they are at the same level they are at the same page minimum errors are done so that no misinterpretation of the question is done okay and uh, you talked about filling up a forma so uh, can you tell like describe what is a structured forma what is an unstructured forma a little bit of detail on that uh, yes sir uh, sir when we talk about a structured forma it is exactly like a computer algorithm response to question number 1 leads us to response to question number 2 for example the question number 2 has two uh, two responses like yes or no in case if the response is yes then a separate set of questions is there in case if a response no is there then a separate set of question is there once those subset of questions are completed then again to the common questions the person may go so it is like a computer algorithm wherein particular selection of a response channels the information to be collected from a particular subset of questions omitting simultaneously another subset which otherwise stands as not applicable this will save the time whereas the unstructured questionnaires in them there is no algorithm only the question is asked and the response is made so if irrespective of whether the person is eligible for those questions the questions are fired upon him just a common example if we are asking about smoking and pregnancy outcomes and smoking and health related issues smoking and health related issues in population in population we will have male as well as female subjects so in case if it is unstructured we will be asking the female subject questions to the males which may not be pertinent to them or male aspect questions to the females which may be not per- pertinent to them so the interviewee will feel that the responses or the questions asked are irrelevant at the same time interviewer will also feel the same the time which is put in that is also could, could be utilized for some other activity so the time which gets wasted in this that can be minimized that can be minimized by having structured questionnaire in tab it is easy in tab there are already schematics into play which are based on algorithms which give a directionality whereas in the hard copy it is better to write in case if there is a no response go to question number 32 in case if there is yes response then follow this subset of questions so this will help us in saving time and at the same time omitting the questions which otherwise are not applicable because of omission of a particular response and which will help in the data collected which is actually relevant for that particular subject study okay. subject or the study participant so thank you dr sanjeev for a splendid talk and just to uh, add in the end that this is a very important aspect unless and until you handle your data properly whatever hard work goes in your research can actually go a waste so proper data handling storage and cleaning can actually help the statistician who is going to analyze to a greater aspect and to you know quench whatever was your query when this search was started so thank you dr sanjeev A very warm welcome to all from the Atal Bihari Institute of uh, Medical Sciences and Dr. Ramanujan Vaidya Hospital from the Medical Education Technology Division. So we are happy to bring you to our continuing with our workshop on research methodology. So today we talk about biostatistics, the tests of significance and inference taken by Dr. Nitin Sinha, who is a professor in the Department of Medicine and a very keen researcher. So I welcome Dr. Nitin, and I request you to uh, start with your presentation. Thank you.
it is the last part because uh, what happens is this part comes when the entire study is complete now uh, what i mean by complete is that all the things all the data has been accumulated the data has been entered and now finally the researcher decides what was my plan of action which i had thought about when the study was started and now when i have the data how do i go about it and how do i fulfill what i was trying to do so that is where the test of significance come and then finally when he applies the test how does he take out an inference out of it so that the study reaches a logical conclusion so starting with it as i just said it these tests are to be applied once the data is absolutely ready now it is very important for us to understand that the test of significance depend upon the research question that was there that was initially formulated when the study was being conducted when the study was being planned that is when the protocol was being written what was the hypothesis what were the aims and objectives so this is these all you know they will determine what sort of te uh, significance test will be applied to the study so these tests actually test the hypothesis and help to find out whether the null hypothesis which was taken is it accepted or is it rejected that is the whole purpose of these test of significance and whatever inference you draw is to either accept the null hypothesis or to reject the null hypothesis so before i go on to the individual test of significance you know what i will try and do is i will try to give a gist of certain important terminologies which come across when somebody is trying to apply the test of significance the first thing which comes to the mind is what is significance now suppose there is a study which is done and there are two groups one group is group 1 one is group 2 and the group 1 the mean is 12.6 and for the group 2 the mean is 10.9 now these two groups are from a population suppose you may say that they are from a building they are from a society which is two buildings tower 1 and tower 2 we are trying to find out whether the mean hemoglobin of person in tower 1 is uh, almost comparable to the hemoglobin in tower 2 or not so the researcher does a study he collects the samples uh, measures the hemoglobin and finally he has around uh, uh, huge data with him and he tries to find out the comparison of the two groups so what he has to do first is that he has to find out a mean so the mean of group 1 and mean of group 2 now you can see that it is very obvious that the mean of group 1 is higher it is 12.6 but does that actually mean that the mean of the mean of group 1 is actually higher than the mean of group 2 or is it just that this difference is occurring just by chance so it is nature many of the parameters they tend to vary so we have to keep everything in mind and before we reach to a conclusion that no the hemoglobin in group 2 or the building or the tower 2 is much less than what is in group 1 we need to apply the test of significance whether this difference which we are observing is it actually significant difference or is it just by chance so these two terms must be very clear that whenever we are measuring whatever we are measuring and we are comparing we should think whether this difference which is occurring is just by chance and if it is just by chance the null hypothesis is accepted most of the time and if it is occurring not by chance then the null hypothesis stands rejected so when we are trying to do this we try to fix a level i will just come to that in the next slide so that level that is around 5% this is the most common level which we said this is 5% that is called level of significance i will just tell you in the next slide that how what is this level of significance and all but important point here is that the level of significance and the power of the study it has to be fixed before the analysis is done rather it is to be fixed at the time when the study is being conceptualized when you are writing the protocol then only it is it should be there there is a column in the protocol where it says statistical methods so that statistical method actually you should be writing what is the level of significance that you are going to take in your study when you do the final analysis and then what is the power of the study which which is uh, being considered this has to be there beforehand then only we can proceed to the test of significance coming to the next and the most important thing which you know mostly puzzles many people and actually many people fantasize about it is the p value now just go back to the previous slide 
the level of significance now what is a p value now suppose there is a population and in this population we have around 10 samples so 10 sample maybe one sample is of 50 one sample is of 40 one is of 30 one is of 55 so there are 10 samples and if we take out mean suppose we are measuring hemoglobin and if we take out the mean of these 10 samples for hemoglobin and if we plot them most of the time it follows a normal distribution curve so this is the population mean the mean in the center is called the population mean the mean of the entire population which we are considering not of the 10 individual samples so if you plot the 10 individual samples means and you form a graph or a curve this is called as the normal standard distribution curve since it's a biological variable hemoglobin most of the times it will follow a uh, gaussian distribution or this normal curve now look at this value what happens is suppose i have an 11th sample now all these 10 means are here but i take out a sample and i measure the hemoglobin and it gives me a value the mean value but that mean value is coming somewhere here not in this area now the chance that if you draw a sample now i am repeating myself and uh, that if you draw a sample and if you find out a particular variable which was of interest in your study and you calculate that value the probability that the mean of that particular variable will fall in this area or this area is called as the p value so p is called as the probability value the probability suppose if i have taken the 11th sample the probability of the mean of hemoglobin of that 11th sample will it be falling in this area or this area is called as the p value now if it is less than this that is less than 5% because 95% of the observations are mostly here so it is actually if this less than 5% if it is coming then we call it is that this mean is significantly different from the other 10 means so if the sample 11 sample if i take out a mean hemoglobin and if it is coming in this area the probability then i can safely say that no this 11 sample mean is statistically different from the mean hemoglobin which i have observed in rest of the 10 samples however if the probability found no of the mean is here then i say no no this difference was just by chance from the other 10 there is no statistical significance between the uh, means so this point has to be very clear to all the researchers that what is p value and how do we interpret a p value now another term which is used very commonly is confidence interval now what is a confidence interval suppose that in many of the journals or many of the uh, articles you will find that it is written p is equal to 0.04 and in bracket they have written this interval this is called as the confidence interval now what is meant by a confidence interval it just means that if this sort of a study which is under consideration is conducted on a similar population with similar inclusion exclusion criteria with almost similar level of significance and almost similar sample size 95% of the time the p value will fall within this range this is what is called as the confidence interval so confidence interval just you know it gives a range of p values so nowadays in most of the journals in most of the esteemed journals you will find that they are not going about one value called as the p value they say okay you give us a range of p values in which this will fall so you will see that if this is significant in confidence interval also whatever p values are coming in this range they are also of significance so it just strengthens whatever you have done as analysis this is what is confidence interval coming to the next aspect is power of a study now there are two hypotheses we all know these two hypotheses are null and alternate hypotheses so if we have a null hypothesis which means the mean of sample 1 is equal to mean of sample 2 then there is an alternate hypothesis which says that the mean of sample 1 is not same as mean of sample 2 now we are not committing here whether this mean of sample 1 is more than sample 2 or less than sample 2 we are just saying it is different this is called alternate so if suppose 
there is actually a difference between the mean of sample one and sample two. There is actually a difference. The probability that a study will detect this difference is the power. So if there is actually a difference, how much is the strength in the study that it will detect this difference? That is called power. So uh, you can very well say it is just equivalent to specificity. If we, you know, talk in terms of that uh, diagnostic test thing, it is just equivalent to specificity. So if there is a difference, that is if you are rejecting the null hypothesis, because null hypothesis says the means of the two sample is same. But here what is happening is if we are rejecting the null hypothesis, that we know that there is a difference between the two. So will this study be able to detect this difference? That is called as the power of the study. Now in most of the situations, we keep it as 80%. Now, if we can increase the power, suppose if some researcher says, no, no, I want to increase the power, I will keep it at 90%. So whenever he tries to keep it at 90%, he will have to calculate a sample size to start the study. That sample size will increase. So in order to make a study much more powerful, you will have to analyze more number of people. So that is what is the power of a study. So this actually comes into play when we are calculating the sample size at the time of protocol writing. This much sample size, I am minimum sample size I will do in my study. So at that point of time, if uh, somebody has done a research, you will realize that power of a study is always asked whenever you're using softwares or mathematical calculations to use sample size, power of the study is a very important factor which is asked. Now some other terms which I would like to tell you before we jump on to the test of significance, we must know what is the variable under consideration. So please try and figure out whether your variable is qualitative or quantitative. If it is hemoglobin, it is quantitative. If it is age, it is quantitative. If it is diabetes, it is yes, no. That it becomes qualitative. So what is the variable which you are trying to assess? What is the variable? What is your interest of study? So whether that thing is qualitative or quantitative, that is also important. That will also govern the type of test of significance which you would like to use. Coming to independent groups and paired groups. Now, this is a very important term. Now, consider what is an independent groups. Now, here one subject of the study is only in one group and is not present in the other group. Now, here what I am trying to say is just the first example which I gave of two buildings, hemoglobin of one uh, or building one and hemoglobin of building two. Now, the person who is residing in building one cannot be in building two. So that means the group of subjects in building one are independent of the group of subjects in building two. So one subject is not being repeated into the other group. This is called independent group. Now coming to the paired group. Now paired group just means that the same subject is assessed as different points in the study. Suppose if a researcher wants that he wants to calculate or he wants to know the effect of giving iron on hemoglobin. He has a baseline hemoglobin of the patient, suppose at before the start of iron, and then he wants to calculate the rise in hemoglobin after giving one month of iron therapy. And he wants to calculate the hemoglobin at 10th day of therapy, 20th day of therapy and 30th day of therapy. So what will he do? He will call the patient on 10th day, 20th day and 30th day. The same patient sample will be taken. Patient number one at baseline, then at 10th day, then at 20th day, then at 30th day. So the same person sample is being repeated. This is called paired group. So here there will be four groups. When he will be analyzing the example which I am telling, the researcher will be analyzing, he will have four groups. One at baseline, one at 10th day, one at 20th day, one at 30th day. But the, it will be the same patient whose four samples are being taken. This is called paired group. So they are not independent. It is the same person person who's being analyzed at different points of time in the study. Now, one of the most important concepts which guides towards test of significance is normality. Now, uh, I think uh, uh, two of the biostatistics lectures which, will, uh, which have been taken before this lecture, somebody must have covered normality. But I'm trying to highlight few points about normality uh, before we jump to the test of significance. Normality is basically done for quantifiable variable. Look at this variable thing. What is your interest of study? Whether you're mentioning hemoglobin, albumin, whatever the thing is, what is the point of consideration in your study? 
if it is quantitative then it is called normality then normality come into picture now it normality what does it tell it just tells that suppose if you have collected uh, or the researcher has collected 100 hemoglobin samples it will tell whether these 100 values are distributed normally or they are distributed not normally normally means normal gaussian curve or are these values not following the normal gaussian curve this is what normality tells and why is it important because if normal if the values are following a normal distribution then there are certain tests of significance which can be applied and there are certain which cannot be applied which we'll just discuss in subsequent slides but for you it must be known but how to check normality a researcher can ask how can we check normality so there are certain methods there are graphical methods to check normality there then there is qness kurtosis and then most importantly there are normality tests these tests like shaproville kolmogorov spinoff anderson darling lily force tests are used now shaproville test if it is used it is used for samples which are around 50 to 100 but for very large sample sizes you can go for kolmogorov spinoff and even shaproville so these tests if you if the researcher is using any software or the biostatistician is using software these tests are done and then it is realized whether the set of distribution set of values is following a normal curve or not once it is certain that the set of normal curve is following a normal distribution then we can jump on to a particular set of test of significance or if they are not following a normal distribution then we have to jump to some other test of significance so this is very important now in concept of normality there are you know there are uh, many school of thoughts so these tests are definitely the Uh, one of the best measures to check normality but some people say that if the sample size is more than 50 you can assume that the data is normal somewhere you will find that if it is more than 100 you can assume data to be normal but from my point of view i will always advise that go for a test check whether this distribution of a particular variable is normal or not then decide to go for the test now coming to one of the concepts called as one tail versus two tail test now what is a one tail and what is a two tail so what is what i am trying to do is here is that this, this is just the normal gaussian curve which i had shown in one of the slides earlier the normal gaussian curve this is the central mean value and what you are trying to see here is that normally these two areas you no know, these are called as the values which are occurring beyond chance so if it is 5% then it is said that 2.5 is here and 2.5 is here if it is occurring just you know on one side we take it is called 5% now where we use one tail test and where we use a two tail test suppose if there is a manufacturer who has produced a new drug now we he already knows that there is another drug in the market which is doing quite a good job and the people are getting recovered from it and everything but he finds that his drug cost of manufacturing is cheaper than that drug so what he wants to do he just wants to show that his drug is as effective as the standard drug he does not want to prove that my drug is superior to the already existing drug he, he will he is not bothered because even if he shows that the drug is equally effective than the uh, first drug his job is done because his drug is cheaper so it will be purchased more so he will decide to do just one tail test because he does not he is not conceptualizing the idea that his drug can be inferior or superior to the drug he has just one idea in his mind it should be as equal to the first drug which is called as an equivalence trial but i'm not going to do that so he just he has just one idea that my drug should be as effective as equal as the old drug in the market so since there is only one idea it is called one tail test now coming to the second he is now realizes the no 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 his new drug is doing much more better for the patient as compared to the first drug so he has to prove that his drug is a superior drug to the first drug but is it superior it can turn out to be inferior also so if he has to check whether his drug is better than the first then the result can be better result can be non better also so when there is a dilemma then we use a two tail test so if there is clarity that 
my idea is going towards one direction it is called one tail test and if it is a you know whatever you are measuring in a population it can be good it can be bad then when if you are comparing between the two groups you might not know whether this variable will be same as the in between the two groups or in one group it will be higher or in one group it will be lower then you have to use a two tail test so after dealing with all these terms significance power confidence interval p value one tail two tail normality once you are clear with all these concepts and once you are ready then we jump on to the test of significance now we can as i have already told you we can dis, dis, you know divide the test for significance into quantitative test for quantitative variables and test for qualitative variables now once we are talking about quantitative variables then we can divide these tests into parametric tests which compare the means between the groups and non parametric tests which compare the mean ranks or the median now important point is as i told you when i was discussing normality that parametric tests are to be applied only if the variable is normally distributed in each group each group and non parametric test is to be applied if there is non normal distribution in any of the groups or all the groups so when once this concept is clear there are certain names of the test and i have written certain examples now what i will try to do in my next slides is that i will be showing you certain studies and how to approach a test for significance now coming to study number 1 there is a researcher who decides to check serum magnesium levels in patients in a medical icu and he decides to check its association with mortality a very common sort of a study in critical care albumin magnesium you know, something or the other for checking mortality so now as i told you and now now what i'm trying to do is whatever i have told you in my lecture before this slide i'm trying to now consolidate it into this into this practical aspect so the level of confidence is 95 that is significance become 5% so it is preset power is 80% it is preset now what is the variable under consideration it is the magnesium level so finally when this researcher will get a data he will have two groups one those who are survivors and one those who are non survivors and he will have magnesium levels in survivor group versus magnesium level in the non survivor group this is what finally he is going to get he might be having age he might be having gender and other things but what was his commitment as the primary goal to check magnesium levels between the two groups so we will concentrate on that so now he will have two groups survivor non survivor and he has to check magnesium level which is a quantitative variable you can measure magnesium level in the serum or the blood it is not a qualitative variable yes or no magnesium will be there and there will be a definite value to it in a particular unit milligram per deciliter now realize this thing that a patient can be in only one group here one who is surviving cannot become cannot have mortality and one who is having mortality cannot become a survivor so they are two independent group of patients so we have two independent groups and we have a quantifiable variable so we need to check the normality now once we are checking the normality we have to check in both the groups survivor group magnesium in survivor group magnesium in non survivor group and if it is normal then or non normal that will you know, decide the type of test of significance now whether you will use a one tail test here or a two tail test we will use a two tail test why because we don't know whether the magnesium levels in our study will be same as that of the between the two groups survivor non survivor will the survivors have higher magnesium as compared to the non survivor or will the survive non survivors have higher magnesium level as compared to survivors we cannot interpret this before the study is completed so it has to be a two tail test it cannot be a one tail test if you apply a one tail test then it is going to be wrong the interpretations are going to go haywire so finally after everything normality and all if the magnesium levels are normally distributed in both the groups survivor and non survivor we will use an independent sample t test which we normally call as a student t test if 
the nor if the values of magnesium are not normally distributed in either of the group survivor non survivor or in both the groups then we will use what is called as the man whitney u test which is a non parametric test so just going back to the table we had this situation in the study two independent sample survivor non survivors if magnesium was following normal distribution independent sample t test if magnesium was not following normal distribution in either group or both the groups we have to use a man whitney u test which is a non parametric test so that is how you have to decide which test of significance we have to use coming to this we will go to another study serum albumin levels in different severities of covid 19 now again we will fix the level of confidence power we know variable under consideration is we are comparing albumin in different severity grades of covid 19 so it is what is under consideration is serum albumin which is a quantitative variable so we all know from covid 19 that there are three severity groups in covid mild moderate severe based on the oxygen saturation so whatever the patient will be taken either the patient will be mild moderate or severe based on the spo2 at presentation so a patient can only be in one group either the patient will be mild moderate or severe it is not that the patient is mild again from next day to jumping to moderate no since this classification is based only on spo2 at presentation so patient is classified as mild moderate and severe based on that so this if each patient will be in just one group this patient cannot jump to another group in analysis so there are now three independent groups in my previous example there were two independent groups now we have three independent groups now we have to check normality of albumin values in all the three groups so once the data is ready on the master chart this researcher will have three groups albumin in mild group albumin in moderate group albumin in severe group so he has to check normality in all because it's a quantifiable variable and then again he will have to use a two tail test now it should be beyond uh, doubt that why he should use a two tail test now if the albumin levels are normally distributed in each group mild moderate severe then he has to use one way anova but if the albumin levels are not normally distributed in either of the group or in all the three groups then he has to use kruskal wallis h test so that is how an approach to a significance test has to be done now since there are more than three two groups now in the previous example it was very simple magnesium level between survivor and non survivor but now here it's a problem because now there are three groups so suppose one way anova is applied this researcher decides to do one way anova he gets a p value which is less than 0.05 that means that the al uh, albumin levels is significantly different between the three groups mild moderate and severe now but but between which three but between which groups is it between mild moderate moderate severe or severe mild or all the three we don't know this p value is one value so how is researcher going to interpret whether this significance is between which groups so there what we call what we talk about is post hoc analysis but there is a proper mathematical method to calculate it and in software it is done uh, you have to select with one way anova post hoc analysis and post hoc analysis gives that thing that in between which groups is this difference significant which will give more meaning to the study which the researcher is doing maybe the difference or significant difference was only between mild and severe between mild and moderate there was not much of a difference between moderate and severe there was no significant difference but yes between mild and moderate severe there is a difference i will discuss the third example systolic blood pressure in patient with anxiety and response to amimin treatment so now just concentrate here on the one thing it is a systolic blood pressure which is a quantitative variable again now here look at the true groups pre treatment and post treatment now here the researcher decides he will measure the blood pressure at baseline and finally he will give a drug to anxiety patient abimin and after what after around 20 days he will again check the blood pressure so this same patient who was on day 1 will be called on day 20 to check the blood pressure after he has taken the drug so this becomes a paired group it is not an independent sample same patient is being you know 
monitored for 20 days and after 20 days another blood pressure reading is there so this is paired sample we have discussed independent sample now this is paired sample now normality uh, we have to check in both the groups the researcher and finally if it is normally distributed he has to use a pair t test and if it is not normally distributed he has to use wilcoxon sign drank test now coming to the statistical test to compare qualitative variable variable in which you cannot measure it is yes no mild moderate severe so it either it is ordinal or it is nominal so this is called qualitative so again i have put in a table so uh, i will just give one example for this also now it is prevalence of low birth weight in kandopur village and association of association of economic status with this low birth weight so here the variable is low birth weight this is a qualitative variable but a low birth weight is there or not and it is based upon measurement only but we are not putting that measurement here we have to classify that into low birth weight yes or no and it is to be seen whether this low birth weight is associated with the economic status or not so how are you going to assess it you are going to draw a two cross two table this is called as the two cross two table now low birth weight normal weight low social economic high social economic this is that is how so some patient will be in a some patient will be b some patient will be c some will be d this is a normal two cross two table and this is called as the observed value this is what the researcher gets this is called the ev is called as the expected value which is to be calculated for each cell this cell this cell this cell and this cell and how is it calculated row total divided by column total divided by the total number of subjects enrolled in the study so why is it done because if the expected value in any of the four cells if the expected value in any of the four cells is less than 5 we have to use fisher exec test to check association and if it is more than 5 in all the four cells it is we have to use pearson chi square test to check association now coming to the inference part now this step comes after the suitable test of significance has been applied researcher knows which test to be applied and now he has applied this test now he has to see whether this is whether what result is coming out of that test now either the researcher can use normal logical method, uh, mathematical formula of the test and all or he can use software and finally he has to decide whether whatever difference he is getting is by chance or is it significance now whenever he applies a test a test statistic is calculated so whatever test he is applying whether it is anova whether it is wilcoxon or something a particular value will come out after applying this formula that is called as the test statistic now as i told you in the very initial part of my lecture he has to take this test statistic and he has to check the probability of getting this test statistic checked this checking of probability what what is the probability that will give the p value now if the probability is less than 0.5 he will term this difference as significant that is how he will infer, that is how he will derive an inference now i will tell you an example this is just an example of serum albumin levels among patients of sepsis of different patient who die or survive in a tertiary care hospital level of significance is 5 power is 80% albumin is a quantifiable variable and there are two independent groups survivor and non survivors Serum albumin needs to be checked and recorded for the two groups, and normality is to be checked. So this is just a revision of what we have talked about in the initial part of the lecture. Now, finally, the researcher gets mean albumin of survivor, which are twelve in number, as three point two, and mean albumin of non-survivor, which are twenty, to be two point seven. Now, is this difference statistically different or not? So he checks normality, and now he has to check whether it, this difference is by chance or not. Now, if it is normally distributed, he decides to go for the independent sample t test. Now, he is using the mathematical calculation. He is using the formula. So, with the formula, he gets a value of 2.48. Then there is a term called as degree of freedom. So, he has to check that degree of freedom, and he has to check the probability in this chart of t table. Now, look at uh, the total sample size is 30, uh, uh, 32 minus 2 is called degree of freedom. So 30 is the degree of freedom and look at this value 2.45 so this is the value he is getting 2.48 this is the closest value he is getting 2.45 and look at the probability of getting this value it is 0.02 this is the p value this is called as the p the probability of getting the value which he is getting in a test in the test which he has applied 
it's called as the p value so it is 2% that means the difference which he has got in these albumin values is statistically significant now nowadays this is the era of softwares so uh, with the advent of software there is no need to rely on remembering formulas and lengthy calculations and there are different kind of software available the basic is excel then spss then r commander actually g power is more for sample size it is not for uh, all the statistical calculation but r commander spss and excel are commonly used so coming to the end of my lecture if we define a if you have to do a test of significance the level of confidence or significance power has to be decided in the beginning normality has to be checked for quantifiable data appropriate test of significance has to be applied based on study design and correct interpretation has to be taken out uh, i will dedicate this talk to one of my friends and he is actually my teacher dr prabhakar mishra who is in department of bio statistics and health information uh, in sdpdi lucknow thank you thank you dr nitin that was actually a master class and uh, i'm sure that whoever watches this will gain a lot and you know feel confident to do all this analysis Uh, if possible or by themselves so we have time for uh, a few quick questions dr raghav uh, good afternoon sir that was a very elaborate lecture i have a few questions sir uh, one is uh, when we are talking about non parametric and param parametric tests uh, how are the parametric tests uh, superior to non parametric tests okay uh, see the basic difference between the two tests is power now this is not power of the study this is power of the test which i am talking talking about so there is a different this is actually calculated mathematically so parametric tests have more power as compared to non parametric tests now suppose if there is an existing difference uh, which is to be taken out in the study we know that there is some difference so the power to pick that difference out is more with the parametric test than non parametric now one thing i would like to highlight here is that though it is very easy to say that if it is not normally distributed we should use a non parametric test but we should try as a researcher and as a bio statistician to convert the non uh, non normal data to normal so it can be converted by means of logarithm so many of the bio statistician they try to convert the non normal data to to a normal data by the help using a logarithmic scale so that they can apply what they call as the parametric test because they have more power so but Uh, on the other side non parametric tests have an advantage that they can even compare ordinal data and median which the parametric test cannot they can only compare means so they both have their pros and cons but if you talk about power in terms of mathematics then parametric tests have much more power than non parametric tests okay thank you dr nitin so thank i just want to you talked about the sample size if we can take a rough value of 50 and we should be safe i, I just so i wanted to add that uh, though we can assume with a large sample size that the data would be normal and it could be used for a parametric test uh, there is also the effect of the effect size if the effect size of the study is large enough as compared to previous data that also ensures uh, uh, you know application of parametric tests so the calculation of sample size is a different topic but there are these two parameters which are very important so if you if you feel that your study will contribute significantly to the effect size that you will have a large difference difference between the population studied then also the sample size could be uh, reasonably managed yes dr raghav or dr himanshu any other questions sir uh, while talking about uh, level of significance and confidence interval sir uh, like can we increase the confidence uh, interval say like 95 to 99 and also the level of significance from uh, 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 95% to 99% sir okay that's a very good question dr raga because uh, see now this actually comes to type 1 error so uh, what you are trying to do is now uh, i don't have the slides right now but thing is if we just go by the normal distribution curve now we have set a limit as 5% that any 
mean suppose we are calculating means if any mean of a population is coming uh, you know probability of that mean coming in the normal range to coming in that extreme range is uh, you know less than 5% then we call it as a significant thing now assume that we keep it as 1% so whatever uh, no probability which is coming like 0 0.03 0 0.04 though if we have kept it at 5% they all will be taken as significant but if we are keeping it at 1% then unless and until the probability is less than 1% of getting that difference it will all be called as accrued by chance so the problem is if we keep it at 1% the sample size is going to increase now because this level of significance has to be there if when we calculate sample size so statistics come much much later for analyzing the study so the initial part is writing the protocol and getting a sample size so in that thing if you put 1% as the level of significance it is going to give you a large sample size because to detect a small difference you will have to analyze more number of people it is just like power if we increase the level of power you have to analyze more number of patients so again the problem comes is suppose if there is a difference but that difference is giving a probability of around 4% 4% if you keep it at 1% you are going to miss that difference which is actually clinically significant but since your level of significance is only 1% you are going to miss it so you know this actually has to whenever we uh, in, you know uh, try to incorporate or try to formulate a study in the protocol stage that is what is the idea of reviewing the literature so when when we write a review of literature it is not just that to read the study okay this has four studies so i will do one there are many things which you have to read in depth so that you can decide upon this level of significance this level of the power of the study so you know this all these studies have to be read in great detail then only you should try and formulate your study decide level of significance and power so that is how it has to go i would just like to add dr nitin uh, yes. in relation to raghav's question that like he said that this is also by convention because it has been seen that in clinical see medicine is an empirical science it's not a mathematical science so you need to have some clinical judgment also if you make your criteria very stringent sometimes those criteria are not clinically relevant that is what dr nitin also added one is the sample size which is a practical problem the second is that such narrow differences because you will see a natural variation of observations in every patient in every clinical scenario so the there has to be a level of significance which has to cover for that variation Exactly. and that is what researchers over the years have kept a uh, conventional at level 5%. of significance at 5% and in circumstances which which demand for more stringency there are studies which take even more stringent 1% that is yeah. the idea that is what we must know yes so dr nitin my personal question to you is since i'm sure yes. that with so much of knowledge you must be doing your own analysis and i dare say that i also try to do the same so which software do you think that you know is for a beginner or somebody who has got a basic grasp because you know nowadays r is a uh, open source software and it has a uh, yes. lot of advantages for uh, new researchers so which software do you think one should venture into if at all okay sir uh, if you are talking about somebody who has just started uh, analyzing and he wants to you know uh, do some basic analysis then nothing better than excel because in excel you can do uh, proportion studies and everything to so the basic formula and all make very nice so, graphs also right right, right. Uh, so excel is one of the best if that person can do on excel now if he wants to further try and do certain more mathematical calculations and all and he wants inbuilt formulas or inbuilt t test and everything then spss comes next now why spss because it is there for a very long time so many of the people are quite well versed with using spss like i will talk about myself i prefer spss because i learned everything on spss but i am much more comfortable with spss as compared to excel so i started on spss so i am continuing spss for last almost 6 7 years so it all depends upon the person also where he is more comfortable but for a beginner excel is the best then spss and as sir said r is now r software is now one of the in things so i i am also trying to get a training on r so, uh, r commander somewhere sir just got it <laughs> they will go together I, i think we should do that together <laughs> again a lot from you right sir so dr nitin thank you for that very educational talk and uh, we had a good time and i hope that uh, we we'll, 
join it to the other complimentary talks and uh, even make it more yes. significant. Thank you very much for thank all you. Thank to you join sir. us in thank this. You for an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the thank you. Sir.